Halo 2's release marked a turning point, not only in the franchise, but the gaming industry itself. In its first week of release, Halo 2 became the highest grossing entertainment event ever. But it wasn't a clean victory. Halo 2's development was tortured, with much of the team burnt out and demoralized by the months of crunch required to ship the game, and even then watching tons of features be cut along the way, including the entire third act of the single player mode. Halo 2's multiplayer was revolutionary, and the overwhelming sales numbers ensured that the team would have a chance to pay off that infuriating cliffhanger at the end of the campaign. So, how does a team pick up the pieces after destroying itself? The fight to deliver Halo 2 was so arduous that Bungie co-founder Jason Jones, the chief wizard behind Halo's curtain, left the company without plans to return, uncertain if he would ever develop games again. Speaking as a guy who took a long break from doing all this, I get it. Halo 2 was Bungie's apocalypse now, a troubled, messy masterpiece that drove everyone involved to the brink of insanity. But for those that remained, the one thing they could all agree on with Halo 3 was they wanted to make a great game to say goodbye to Master Chief. Jones' departure left a leadership vacuum within the Halo team that didn't have a clearly defined heir apparent. With Jones gone, there wasn't a natural candidate to take over as the game lead. Ultimately, the role was offered to Max Hoberman, the man who had led the development of the party game multiplayer of Halo 2 and the industry-changing innovation to online matchmaking that modern games still model to this day. Hoberman, a talented designer and engineer, swiftly ran headfirst into the sticky spider's web of internal politics. There were a number of team members vying for creative primacy. A cold war of creative battles waged amongst the different departments. Things never reached the dangerous redline territory of Halo 2, but Halo 3 was off to a messy start. Joseph Staten, the man who was responsible for Halo's story so far, had a falling out with designer Marcus Leto. As a result, he pieced out. Without Joe's guiding force, the campaign development fell to a series of story committees that struggled to find their footing. Many meetings devolved into shouting matches with no general consensus about the direction the story should take. Needless to say, what this process created wasn't great. Halo's longtime composer Marty O'Donnell recalled receiving an initial draft of the story and feeling it was flat. There were no stakes, no surprises. It was all pretty by the numbers. It wasn't until he saw the 2005 film Serenity that he realized exactly what the story needed. Death. Lots and lots of death. O'Donnell took on the role of Grim Reaper. He proposed the death of Miranda Keys, the murder of Sergeant Johnson at the hands of Guilty Spark 343 and Chief's subsequent revenge on the Monitor. He took the notes to the various members of the story committee who all basically told him, I pitched that, but everyone told me to f*** off. Been there. As this higher stakes version of the Halo 3 campaign took shape, Joe Staten was working half a planet away on a completely different Halo game with famed real life hobbit Peter Jackson. But why was Peter Jackson making his own Halo game? Because PJ was also working on a Halo movie. Halo was Microsoft's biggest property, and you know when a corporation finds something people want? They spam the crap out of it. T-shirts, action figures, novels to read when you get cut off from playing Xbox for playing too much Halo. And the holy grail of entertainment legitimacy, a big budget movie. While the team at Bungie was hard at work on Halo 3, Microsoft was going after Hollywood hard. In June 2005, Microsoft sent three costumed Spartan soldiers around town in Hollywood. They headed to New Line, Fox, Universal, DreamWorks, among others, with a red attache that contained a script written by Alex Garland, the writer behind 28 Days Later, who would later create sci-fi bangers like Ex Machina and Annihilation. The case also contained the list of demands from Microsoft for the privilege of making a Halo film. The stunt, put together by mega agency CAA, was meant to create a spectacle while also putting public pressure on the studios, who only had a couple hours to read the screenplay and decide if they wanted to bid on the Halo movie. Microsoft was asking for better terms than any other adaptation in Hollywood history. Not even Harry Potter commanded as good a deal. Sure, Master Chief was blockbuster ready, but video game movies were still 
this. The deal included demands for 60 first-class plane tickets to the premiere, a Microsoft exec to sit in on every cut in post-production, approval of the director, the cast, oh, and Microsoft would retain all merchandising rights. You know, the important stuff. Some studios said no. Others said, hell no. Harvey Weinstein called CAA screaming about how Miramax hadn't been visited by a master chief in a call that ended, I presume, with him saying, I'm a sexual predator who deserves to die in prison. Finally, only Fox and Universal remained in the mix. The two studios worked out a deal with each other and said they would partner on the film instead of spiraling into the bidding war Microsoft wanted. Oops. Microsoft wanted a big name director. Guillermo del Toro was interested, but soon dropped out to make Hellboy 2. Next, they scored Peter Jackson as producer. Peter Jackson's protege, Neil Blomkamp, would be the new, much cheaper director. Blomkamp, a South African director with a stunning filmography of short films and commercials, took Halo in a distorted, gritty, handheld direction. Props, costumes, and even a life-size, fully functional warthog were created. As part of this Peter Jackson-centric Halo explosion was also a game set in the Halo universe. Jackson was no stranger to the world of gaming, having heavily collaborated with Ubisoft on Peter Jackson's King Kong, the official game of the movie, which I believe won most unnecessary words in the title of a video game at the 2005 G-Foria Awards, right before La La Land won Game of the Year. You're damn right we're making g 4 e references. Jackson established Wingnut Interactive in 2006, and the first project they were set to work on was Halo Chronicles, a prequel to the main trilogy that would have followed an unnamed soldier as he battled against the Prometheans, a force that was previously only hinted at in the series lore. And who better to consult on Halo lore than Joe Staten, the newly available free agent. For a time, Joe was the de facto head of franchise for Halo as he helped the Jackson team expand both the gaming and film universe as well as lending his expertise to Ensemble Studios as they worked on their own Halo Wars RTS project. But the excitement started to wear off and the sickening feeling of going in circles began. The money being spent on the film started spiraling higher and higher. There were too many cooks, too many restrictions, and everyone loved what Blomkamp was working towards except for all of Microsoft and most of the studio executives. Before things went sideways, Blomkamp shot a test short using that drivable warthog and a bunch of assets developed by Weta. It was definitely not this. Within 18 months of the Master Chief pissing off Harvey Weinstein, the Halo movie was dead. Years later, Blomkamp and Jackson went on to make District 9, for Sony no less, as a way to exercise the trauma from the unmade Halo film. Watching it back, it's hard to ignore glimpses of what might have been. Chasing the Hollywood Dragon was fun, but Bungie still had a game to make. Remember that? The actual game? And there were problems. Microsoft's new console, the Xbox 360, was swiftly approaching. It had more horsepower, which was good for Halo 3, but it had completely changed the Xbox Live technical architecture, which was bad. This engineering decision by the Xbox team meant the revolutionary multiplayer system that Max Hoberman had worked so hard to perfect in Halo 2 was utterly broken on the 360 before they even started. The team was already a year behind on day one. Jamie Gressimer, gameplay designer extraordinaire and godfather of modern FPS control scheme from way back on the original Halo Combat Evolved, wanted to innovate. He felt that the team was too skittish after hitting burnout on Halo 2. They were playing it too safe. Halo 3 needed at least one or two new gameplay mechanics to spice it up. Jamie's idea was to boot up a bunch of small test builds to create five or six new gameplay mechanics. He assumed most would fail, but a couple might work, and they could include a couple features in Halo 3 and rest easy. These included equipment, flood and multiplayer, scare battle sequences. The problem? The new mechanics all worked. And rather than cut any of them, maybe to make up for how brutal the cuts had been to Halo 2, Gressimer and the team fought to keep them all. Soon after the demise of the Halo film and Halo Chronicles game, Joe Staten returned to the Bungie team to help bring the campaign home. Max Hoberman, on the other hand, was on his way out. Christmas 2006, the year before Halo 3 was to launch, he put in his notice. He'd done immense work with the team to get multiplayer working on the new Xbox Live for the 360, and now he was done. He wanted to start his own company, 
And that's exactly what he did. He'd be officially gone before Halo 3 ship. The summer of 2006, Halo 3 had been officially revealed at E3. It was greeted with the proper rapid fanfare from gamers that you'd expect from a Halo game. But if you couldn't tell by that self-indulgent detour into Tinseltown we made a few minutes ago, Halo wasn't just a game anymore. It was a brand that had a life of its own, and the team at Bungie were weary of being custodians of Microsoft's 800-pound Craig. Halo was never meant to become such an all-consuming life's work for Bungie. Hell, if everything went according to plan, Halo 2 would have been the end of the franchise. Many at the studio felt like they were becoming the Halo factory, expected to make Master Chief shape golden eggs for Papa Microsoft on an infinite assembly line. Much like DJ Khaled, they were suffering from success. It was at this point that Bungie began thinking about their destiny and what kind of company they ultimately wanted to be. The only way forward was to go independent again, and that meant breaking up with Master Chief. Key members of the Bungie team began negotiating with Microsoft for a way to split back into an independent studio. The deal they struck was right out of the Taylor Swift Scooter Braum playbook. Bungie would make three more Halo games, and then they would be free to own their own IP again. Those three games would be Halo 3, Halo 4, which would end up being called Halo Reach, and another Halo game in between those two. That middle game was intended to be Halo Chronicles, the Peter Jackson game, which was now defunct. They'd have to figure something else out, but that problem would have to wait because they had a multiplayer beta to release. Any Xbox 360 owner from 2007 remembers Crackdown. If you never played it, I'm so sorry for you. The original Crackdown was f***ing awesome. It was a superhero game before superhero games were a thing. It introduced innovative vertical platforming and deeply satisfying open world exploration into an action shooter game of all things. Oh, and you needed the disc to play the Halo 3 multiplayer beta. The beta launched in May of 2007 and it kicked off the home stretch to Halo 3's launch. The following month, there was an exclusive Halo 3 Zoom. And on July 7th, Bungie was officially on paper an independent entity again. Days later on July 11th, at E3, the weird E3 of 2007 that took place at an airplane hangar at hotels, Microsoft took over a presentation stadium at Santa Monica High School and debuted a new Halo 3 campaign trailer. All that was left was to sell the crap out of the damn thing. Where Halo 2 broke ground with the I Love Bees ARG campaign, Halo 3 went all in on heart. The Believe Marketing Blitz was conceived by the same agency behind the haunting Mad World Gears of War trailer. The Halo 3 marketing treated Master Chief and the lore of Halo as sacrosanct, creating intensely earnest material like the War Veterans video campaign. And the Landfall short film shot by Neil Blomkamp when he still thought he might be directing a Halo movie. It was more mature and emotional than any game marketing had attempted before, and it made fans absolutely rabid for the release. Microsoft spent a whopping $40 million on Halo 3's marketing. That was an insane number at the time, especially for a video game. And unlike the last time around, Bungie was actually confident they had a game that could live up to the hype. They weren't building a game the Xbox 360 couldn't run. There were no last minute restarts or drastic changes to the story. They made the game they intended to make. Jason Jones returned to see Halo 3 finished, even if he was only barely involved. And while every game ships with a certain level of stress, Halo 3 was a vast improvement from the unacceptable pressure that Halo 2 had created. Halo 3 launched on September 25th, 2007 and was an instant success. Like Halo 2 before it, Halo 3 set the record for the biggest game launch of all time, bringing in a massive 170 million on day one alone. More than 1 million players logged into Halo 3 on Xbox Live in that same 24 hours. It would move 5 million copies by the end of November, becoming the top selling game in the US that year, despite only being available on the Xbox 360. Sales are great and everything, but was the game any good? The answer is a resounding hell f***ing yes. While the game's campaign did receive some knocks for not introducing as many innovative mechanics as Halo 2, the narrative received praise for bringing the war between humanity and the Covenant to a thrilling and surprisingly emotional close. 
The campaign was an incredibly focused sprint to the finish, filled with surprises, heartbreak, and an epic scale that truly drove Halo home as a space opera worthy of standing alongside the greats. On the multiplayer side of things, Halo 3 became a mainstay for players the world over. In fact, many would consider Halo 3's multiplayer to be a high watermark for the franchise even to this day. Halo 3's Forge mode would upend players' notions of what an online Halo match could be. Bungie had delivered such a robust level creator that people weren't just creating new maps, but entirely new game modes. Perhaps the most famous of all was Griff Ball, a rugby-inspired mode created by Rooster Teeth co-founder and Red vs. Blue creator Bernie Burns. Forge mode is easily the defining aspect of Halo 3's legacy. The level creator has since become a franchise mainstay, and as of 2019, over 6.6 million maps have been created through Forge. In many ways, Halo 3 wound up being the definitive Bungie game. Nearly 15 years later, Halo 3 still stands apart among Halo titles. It was the most played multiplayer title of all the games included in the Master Chief Collection, and for good reason. But for those dwindling few still finishing the fight on their decrepit Xbox 360s, the OG Halo 3 servers will officially turn off on January 13th, 2022. Pour one out for the Chief. Also, you can play this game on a modern console. It's on Game Pass right now. For Christ's sake, stop playing a 15-year-old game disc and enter the 21st century. Both the campaign and multiplayer delivered on the epic promise the studio established with Halo Combat Evolved. And unlike Halo 2, the company didn't have to break themselves to make it happen. If Halo 2 was Bungie's dark night of the soul, Halo 3 was nothing short of redemption. At its fundamental core, Halo is a series about perpetually overcoming insane odds. Bungie managed to overcome challenges that would have crippled countless other game studios, and yet somehow, someway, crafted a trilogy that still stands as one of the most impactful series that gaming has ever seen. And along the way, they earned a path back to freedom to develop new ideas that didn't start with master and end with chief. Bungie was not perfect back then, they clearly have been far from perfect in the recent past, and we presume they are not perfect now. But despite the streaks of arrogance, self-destructive tendencies, and passion that could border on toxicity, the work speaks for itself. I know that was a long one, because I've been speaking it, but I appreciate you sticking around until the end. If you like this video, give us a sub, and know we've got more where this came from. Check out our in-depth review of Halo Infinite, or a breakdown of Cyberpunk 2077 one year after its disastrous launch. Also, be sure to tune in to our X-Play live streams on YouTube and Twitch every week. Now, wait if you need me.